Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to Winds, a literary reading by Sarnia author Delia DeSantis. Translator Maria Pia Spadafora will be reading a short excerpt of Delia's writing in Italian. My name is Licia Canton and I am pleased to be your host today. We are all in different territories at this time. Delia DeSantis is in Sarnia. Maria Pia Spadafora is in Milano, Italy. I would like to acknowledge that I am located on unceded indigenous lands. Joja Gay, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We acknowledge them and other First Nations who care for the land across our country, and we recognize them as Canada's first storytellers. It's my pleasure to introduce Delia DeSantis. Delia DeSantis is an editor and fiction writer. She has co-edited eight literary anthologies, including People, Places, Paths, Passages, published in 2018, a 500 plus page volume featuring 98 Italian Canadian writers. Delia is an award-winning short story writer published in literary magazines and journals in England, Italy, the US and Canada. Her stories have also been published in Italian. Her first book, Fast Forward and Other Stories, published by Longbridge Books in 2008, was well received. She is currently working on a second collection of short stories. For decades, Delia has been active in Sarnia's Italian-Canadian community, and she has volunteered on the executive of the Association of Italian-Canadian Writers for more than 25 years. When she retired from the construction business that she managed with her husband, she focused on writing, cultural activities, and volunteer work. In the coming months and years, Delia plans to make writing her first priority. It is also my pleasure to introduce Maria Pia Spadafora. A native of Calabria, Maria Pia Spadafora is a freelance translator, creative writer, and tutor of Italian, English, and Spanish. She holds a, an MA in Modern Languages and Literature from the University of Calabria, presenting as a final dissertation, the translation and analysis of Licia Canton's The Pink House and Other Stories. In April, 2020, she translated from Spanish to Italian, the story of the short film nominated for Premio Goya 2020, Laura Zamora's El Arbol de las Almas Perdidas, published on Amazon Kindle. Maria Pia Spadafora lives and works in Milan. And now Delia DeSantis will share three of her stories. Welcome Delia. Thank you Licia for the kind introdu introduction and a special welcome to everyone who has taken the time to be here for this literary re event. And now I will begin by reading one of my short stories. Uh, the title of this short story is called um, Dinner for Three. So here we go, dinner for three. We should go out for dinner, the three of us, to be civilized, he says. I am in a kitchen and I have a knife in my hand. I picture myself placing the blade on one side of his face, just above the cheekbone and slicing right into his apple round cheek. When I'm done, I will hold the piece of flesh in my hand and look at it. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's a clean piece of flesh, not a trickle of blood to it. No mess at all. Who needs a messy mutilation? I don't say anything and keep on working. I'm cutting a squash into cubes. The skin is tough and I have to push really hard to get through it. I don't mind. I have good strong wrists. The palms on my hands are getting coated with orange color from the squash. I know that just soap and water will not take it off. I'll have to use bleach and it will make my skin feel tender and sore. But that doesn't matter. I could pour a can of acid on my hands and he wouldn't care. That's because he has her hands to think about. Those slender young hands caressing his neck, drawing him to her. I wonder, 
I wonder what he thought the first time he kissed her. He must have forgotten I even existed. How does the old country steakhouse sound? Homey, I say, smiling. Now I can actually say I know the pain of smiling. Only a month ago, if someone had talked about it, I would have been skeptical. I would have doubted there could be pain in smiling. No, I wouldn't have believed, but I believe now, all right. It's as though I had taken a knife and cut a hole where my mouth is, carved into my own flesh. Ruth, he says, shaking his head. He wants to chide me for my, sar for my sarcasm, but he knows it wouldn't do any good. Besides, he has no right to reproach me. He's moving out tomorrow. Ruth, he says again, leaving the name hanging in the air like a, an object that can be put down. I know that sounds weird. A name is not an object, let alone one that can hang in the air. But under the circumstances, I have a right to some insanity. Yes, he's looking around for a place to let the name rest. He can't stand to leave it suspended like that. It has to be placed somewhere. His head turns here and there. What about the top of the buffet? No, not there. Not enough room. Too many pictures. Our four children and spouses, 13 grandchildren, our family. Nana, why are you getting a divorce? Five-year-old Megan asked me yesterday. I was at my daughter's house babysitting. Oh, my darling, I whisper, hugging the child so hard I nearly break her tender ribs. Why, Nana, she asks again. I make her, I make her sit on my lap. You see, Megan, you're too young to understand. She combs the top of my hair with her little fingers. Do you understand? He says, kissing my forehead over and over again. I'm not a person who cries easily, but yesterday I cried and damn it, I'm doing it again now. A tear has just fallen onto the back of my hand, but when he comes to stand beside me, the tear is not there anymore. And I am glad I avoid wiping my eyes so you won't notice anything. I have my pride. I'll make the reservations, he says, dinner for three. The old country steakhouse, we'll talk, be friends. After he has spoken, he, he still doesn't move away. I don't want him to cl close to me anymore. I associate his nearness with betrayal. We were walking together in Kenatera Park when he first told me the sleeves of our windbreakers touching. Listen, he says now, leaning toward me. I still need your friendship. You know that, don't you? The squash is all cut up. I put it in a baking dish and cover it. There's still lots of time before supper. I'll use the microwave anyway, and it'll be quick. I wash my hands but I have decided not to use the bleach after all. I will let the orange color wear off by itself. After, I clean everything on the counter, leaving the knife till the end. I run cold water on the blade. I know hot water will dull a blade. I hate a knife that won't cut, that isn't nice and sharp. The tap is running full blast. The blade gleams underneath the water. What are you doing, Ruth? What the hell? I pay no attention to him, but after a while, I finally turn the water off. I wipe the knife and put it away. It takes me a minute longer than usual to close the drawer. For God's sake, are you all right? Standing very still for a moment, I take a deep breath. Briefly, I glance his way. 
I never did like blood, and I'm not foolish enough to believe that a wound wouldn't bleed. But I say nothing of this to him. What is the use? Going to the closet, I get my coat. I'm beginning to enjoy going for walks alone. This is the first time I have admitted this to myself. But from now on, my life will be my own. I don't know anyone anything. I certainly don't know this man any more than I have already given him. I trusted him. I guess I'll forget about the reservations, he says, holding the edge of the door. You don't want to go, do you? I don't answer. I don't have to. I never said I would go. In fact, I didn't even hint I would. I'm not ready to offer friendship. Maybe I never will be. The choice is mine. It's autumn and everywhere the leaves are falling. I feel a little like a, a leaf myself. One newly detached from a branch. I am falling and feeling scared, but heady too. The wind tossing me here and there before I land. The earth so soft this time of the year. And uh, that's it for my first piece. And now I'm going to read um, a piece of a flash fix. It's short story or flash fiction, I guess. And uh, it's called, How Many Children Did Mama Have? Um, she, holds, she holds the boy by the hand. Sometimes she forgets he's there, walking beside her. But when she remembers, she's glad she's not alone. Looking down at his bare legs, Angel worries, but she's thankful he doesn't touch his wounds. It could bring infection. She doesn't know where they're going, but they're almost there. She knows by the smells that some cities have, industrial odors, factories. She had lived in a city until the man she married took her to his village. She shakes the boy's arm, wants him to know they'll be all right where they're going. There will be lots of food and water, medications for his wounds. They're almost there. They can hear the, the clatter of traffic, church bells. Take long, they take longer steps, anxious to arrive. Angel has an urge to sing, but instead she hears herself speak. How many children did mama have? Right away she feels bad. She knows she, has, she shouldn't have asked. The question brings some pain. There's something in her that makes her want to hear his answer over and over again. It comes from a gnawing deep inside of her. He looks up at her, but makes no sound. His little mouth is parched from so long without water. Lifting his arm, he opens up four fingers, four. It must be so, she thinks. He has been giving her the same answer all along. His eyes are now tiny round pools and she feels sorrow for his tears. She's not able to feel grief stretches of memory have flown away from her mind. She knows, from, she knows that from the things he has told her. She remembers she, has, she had a husband, but not what he looked like. And there are no children in the memory of her past. With her man, she had been happy. She knows this by the suppleness of her body. The, rum, the roundness of her belly, the gentle way she holds the boy's hand. The village had been a pleasant place to live, but how could she have stayed? The dragon of water and wind had drowned homes and lands. There was nothing left, not even the dead to bury, 
the ocean had laid them all to rest. She remembers wake, waking up on a, on a muddy ground, the boy wrapped around her tight. Mama, he had murmured, the evil from the ocean is all gone. Angel had looked at his sad little face and scraped mud from his cheeks. He had called her mama. She had known then she had to find a way to raise herself from the ground and pull the little boy up. Together, they would find a way to keep on going. And now Maria Pia, um, translated, who translated the story uh, for me, is going to read it. Maria Pia. Grazie. Quanti figli aveva la tua mamma? Tiene per mano il bambino. A volte dimentica che lui si trova lì, che cammina a fianco a lei, ma quanto se ne ricorda è contenta di non essere sola. Guardando le sue gambe nude, Angel si preoccupa, ma ringrazia il cielo che lui non tocchi le sue ferite, potrebbero infettarsi. Non sa bene dove sono diretti, ma sono quasi arrivati. Lo capisce dagli odori che alcune città emanano, quegli odori industriali, di fabbriche. Aveva vissuto in città finché l'uomo che aveva sposato non la portò nel suo paesino. Stringe il braccio del bambino, vuole fargli sapere che staranno bene dove sono diretti. Ci sarà cibo e acqua in abbondanza, medicine per le sue ferite. Sono quasi arrivati, possono sentire il rumore del traffico, le campane della chiesa che suonano. Allungano il passo, ansiosi di arrivare. Le viene quasi voglia di canticchiare, ma si ritrova a dire... Quanti figli aveva la tua mamma? Si sente immediatamente in colpa. Sa che non avrebbe dovuto chiederglielo. La domanda lo ferisce. Ma c'è qualcosa in lei che la spinge a voler sentire la risposta ancora una volta. Proviene da un profondo tormento interiore. Il bambino alza lo sguardo verso di lei, ma non esce alcun suono dalla sua boccuccia secca da troppo tempo senza una goccia d'acqua. Sollevanti il braccio mostra quattro dita. Quattro. Deve essere così, pensa lei. Lui continua a darle sempre lo stesso numero. Gli occhi del bambino ora sono due piccole fontanelle e lei prova tristezza per quelle lacrime. Non riesce a provare dolore. Tratti di memoria sono ormai un ricordo lontano. Lo capisce dalle cose che lui le ha raccontato. Ricorda di aver avuto un marito, ma non che aspetto avesse. E non ha memoria di aver avuto figli. Con il suo uomo era stata felice. Lo intuisce dalla morbidezza del suo corpo, dalla rotondità del suo ventre, dal modo in cui tiene la mano del bambino, delicatamente. Il paesino era stato un luogo piacevole in cui vivere. Ma come sarebbe potuta restare? Il drago dell'acqua e del vento aveva inghiottito le case e la terra. Non era rimasto nulla, nemmeno i corpi da seppellire. L'oceano li aveva messi tutti a riposo. Ricorda di, essere, di essersi svegliata sul terreno fangoso, con il bambino aggrappato intorno a lei, stretto. Mamma, aveva mormorato, il drago è scomparso dall'oceano. Angel aveva guardato il suo faccino triste e gli aveva strustato via il fango dalle guance. Poi lui l'aveva chiamata mamma. In quel momento aveva capito che doveva trovare un modo per sollevarsi da terra e tirare su il bambino. Insieme avrebbero trovato un modo per andare avanti. Grazie. Thank you, Maria Pia. That's beautiful. I love it in Italian. I think it sounds a lot better in Italian. <laughs> okay. And now, um, I guess I'm on to my next uh, short story, which will be actually the last one, the last piece that we'll be reading. And this short story is called In Season. 
Uh, I've never published it because I guess I didn't have time to <laughs> to send it anywhere or whatever. I was busy with other stuff. Okay, so in season, I soaked the bottle in the sink, the one I have been using as a vase. I often do this, put flowers in strange containers. Angela's friends sometimes say, oh, that's a good idea what you did there, but I know they don't really mean it. What else can I say? For most people, feet go in shoes, scarves around their necks. I have no real friends of my own, never did. I have always been a loner, but I know how much friends mean to Angela and I always try my best to be nice to them, putting up with my own inner discomfort. The bottle had a film of grease on it. Everything in my kitchen needs a good scrub. The grease left over from the daily cooking and too much broiling. You name it, and my kitchen has seen it. Angel is a big man, and he likes hearty meals, which I don't mind cooking. And I'm always finding things to preserve. I never let anything go to waste. Today, I'm starting to do what most people call spring clean. But it's no longer spring. It's the beginning of fall. But it doesn't matter. All that matters is that, is that the work is getting done. I am keeping up. I rinse the bottle and dry it until it shines. I love the way it shines. It's an old salad dressing bottle, flat front and back where the label used to be. The sides are etched with two rows of tiny squares like impressions of children's teeth. You still have those flowers, Angelo says. That was over 15 years ago. Sudbury, I echo, pretending not to notice that tiny touch of undercurrent in his voice. He had worked there five months, the longest they'd ever been away. I was so glad when we came back. I was expecting our fourth child late in life, and I was afraid of complications. That's all there was up there, he says, in a far off tone, wild flowers and rocks. I take the dried white flowers with their short stems and place them into the neck of the bottle. Then I lift the bottle and brush the flowers against my nostrils. Their perfume they gave out is the same as it was back then. Well, maybe that is not right. It has changed somewhat. It's more of a washed, off, washed out fragrance now. Nevertheless, some of the essence has remained, lasted all these years. And somehow I believe that it will always be there. But where do these flowers get their life in their dried up form, still giving perfume as they do? I think of miracles. I see blood dripping from the heart of Jesus the statue at the side of the altar of our church. Strange images fleeting through my mind more and more now. Yeah, rocks and a loaf of bread was so expensive, everything. Not much grew up there with all those nickel mines, but I made good money to take home. I turned to him eagerly. Here, smell, they're still like the day you brought them to me. But he continues to stare out the window, ignoring my gesture. I feel hurt. And though I try to hold back the tears, my eyes can't help giving in to the pain of rejection. I look down at my feet. My dress, fitted at the waist, falls in wide pleats to my ankles. It was my grandmother's dress. It goes back many years. There's nothing wrong with it, made of strong weave, durable. It was kept well preserved in a cedar trunk and it came to me by way of inheritance upon my father's death last year. The dress belonged to his mother. The wife of one of Angela's friends buys secondhand clothes previously owned by rich women. 
She brags about it and everyone laughs, applauding her good sense. I wonder if he would have come to stand beside me to smell the flowers if I had been in season. If it had been the middle of spring and I would have been wearing an old pair of jeans as I wiped down the walls, as if my work, as if all my work had been finished before the bright sunlight of summer would start showing the spider webs. Why couldn't you be different? He said to me the other day. I laughed and said, what do you mean? But I knew what he meant. He meant, why couldn't I be like other women? Why did I dress the way I did and never wanted to go out of the house anymore? Not even to do the grocery shopping. Today, his thoughts are leaving there again, and I can tell he's angry. He's wondering why there's unexpected growth of change in me. And he's asking questions of himself, and he cannot find the answers. I have no answers either. I have no answers for anything. I know what is, not what could have been. I know the roundness of his shoulders, and I know he's the kind of a husband who doesn't buy me gifts. But I know a lens of a landscape where a man is leaning down, his workers' hands lifting tiny flowers out of a barren land. I know no more than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's the end of my reading. <laughs> Thank you, Delia. You're welcome. And, and thank you, Maria Pia. It's both beautiful. So we're open to questions if you have any. Uh, Maria Pia, did you have a question for Delia? Would you like to start? Sure, yes. Uh, where did you get the inspiration to write the three stories you're at? Uh, where do I get the inspiration? <laughs> yeah. I, I really don't know. Um, yeah, the one uh, uh, the one I just read um, actually is about the only piece that that I'm my work that I definitely know that it was just fr from looking at these wild flowers that I have. And actually, my husband did work in Sudbury at. Uh, he brought these flowers to me and, I, and amazingly they still smell good and I still keep him but um, from there I guess just just my mind went everywhere I guess and uh, the others I, I'm not sure maybe they uh, where did mama uh, what's the title of that one uh, how many children did mama have <laughs> it's a long title yeah. uh, probably came from, you know, thinking about um, uh, these wind tsunamis and wind storms and what can happen and, you know, stuff like that, you know, stuff just going through my mind, not no particular you know, object or anything. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Celia. Um, can you tell us how living in Southern Ontario inspires your writing? Oh, dear. <laughs> if it does. Uh, well, um, in one way, um, uh, our Sarnia has a, a, well, quite a good community of Italian Canadians and uh, I mingle with them a lot. I mingle with the Canadians and the Dutch and the, the Greeks and everybody, but um, I'm a good a good um, uh, a good listener of di dialogue, and it could just be a piece of dialogue that gets me going, or or a way you know some people view things in the Italian community, or you know stuff like that, and uh, I it's just. Sarnia is just another place. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Maria Pia, do we have any questions in the chat? No, there is no. Okay. When will we when will your new book be out by Jenny Gunn? Oh, I still have to put it together to tell Jenny. <laughs> I've had the story set aside for a long time, but I still haven't even done anything about it. But now um, I'm not doing any editing and um, I seem to be having a little more time, so I'll get to it. So I'll be a little, you know, might be a few months or a year or year and a half. Yeah, I hope I'll be soon. Okay. Yeah. There is another question by uh, Maria Di Sella. Your writing is often so in tune with the seasons, seasonality linked to certain cars, the arrival of spider webs and so on. Would you say this integration is related to growing up in Lazio? Uh, yes, uh, could, it could be because I did grow up on a farm and there was wind and everything and the, and the floods from uh, snow melting on the mountain or whatever. But also um, in Sarnia, we don't live very far from the lake. So the, the, it's always windy. I mean, actually I live in Brights Grove, which is outside of Sarnia and Lake Huron. And, uh, you know, even if I take a walk, there's always wind, but a uh, wind intrigues me. I think it's in a lot of my stories, you know, it's something, it's the movement or whatever. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thanks, Celia. Another question uh, by Rosanna. Battigelli, Delia, your stories are moving and the words and phrases you choose are so fitting and captivating. Have you considered developing any of your stories into a novel? Um, actually, actually, I'm kind of thinking of doing a, um, a, a novella or, um, yeah, so, uh, or a long short story. And I have been working at a, a, a bunch of pieces that um, could all go together, but I'm not really sure if uh, if it is a long, you know, um, novella or whether I just have to take those pieces of writing and turn them into short stories. But yeah, and I did, I do have a written novel in my drawer, but it was from so long ago that I never did anything with it. And yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. When was the last time you pulled out that novel from the drawer? Uh, a long time ago, <laughs> just a second. Um, I think it might have been 20 years. <laughs> so yeah. would you consider pulling it out again and rereading it or let, letting someone read it? Uh, it just feels like it's dated. Uh, yeah. Do you, wanna, do, you, do you wanna share what it's about? Well, it, it was about uh, uh, an Italian Canadian family, and uh, the, the actually it was about they had three kids and and they were all still home uh, as older children and and their different personalities and the personality of the father a lot of characterization. Uh, one felt, you know, the way one son was very um, easygoing, another one was involved with things he shouldn't have been involved in, and, and um, you know, and the daughter being a rebel, and then at the end, at the end, they kind of, you know, things. Well, kind of from what you're saying, it sounds like it, it's still very relevant. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> And uh, Jenny indicates it could be a historical novel, Jenny Gunn, mm. maybe oh. this novel in your drawer. So I think uh, from the comments that I'm reading, um, everybody's in favor of you pulling it out of the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, I, I don't know. It, it's going to take a lot of courage to pull that one out. <laughs> yeah, short stories that come to me easier. 
all I need is like a piece of conversation or uh, looking at a painting or something, you know, I can, I can dream up a short story while I sleep. Then in the morning, I'm not sure if it's there anymore. But <laughs> It may also be that this novel, you know, when you reread it or someone else rereads it, if you don't see it as a novel anymore, uh, you might be able to save some sections and convert them into short stories. Yeah, I probably will. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah. There's some more questions in the chat. Yes, uh, there is a question. Did you write about, by Maria Elisella? Do you write alone or do you ever write with others or do you work with other writers? Um, I usually write alone um, in the evening after supper um, in my computer room by myself. I um, Well, I have joined Legia's uh, shut up and write for a couple of times, but somehow it just uh, didn't, uh, doesn't always, you know, go with my schedule. But yeah, I like to write alone. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's an appropriate question. Have you been able to write and or make notes for stories during the pandemic lockdown? Mm. Lots of time alone now. Uh, not really. I don't know. It's, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of, it's, it's terrible to say, but I'm kind of enjoying the pandemic because <laughs> I've got lots of time to, um, um, I, I don't have to rush out and go out. Actually, my husband's doing the shopping, thank you. And uh, um, I don't go out to for lunch with friends. And, and, and uh, it's just, a, it's been a time for myself in a way, in a way. Uh, another question maybe for me uh how many words are there in italian for wind okay it's just one vento but uh, there are a different name it depends on where it came so there are eight name i think yes and it is um, interesting that uh, in uh, italian we have a lot of words to describe the sound of the wind uh, yeah. yeah thank you <laughs> yeah katarina so. edwards um uh, writes that she remembers another story uh a story of yours delia uh, about a woman and a child in the desert you are drawn to telling tales of a refugee with a child trying to make their way in a blasted landscape um would you like to comment on that delia um, I, I don't, I, I don't remember what, because I've written quite a few stories and some of them are not, uh, polished or whatever, you know, I have them in boxes. Uh, but I am drawn to, uh, rather turbulent situations sometimes. Uh, that kind of affects me, you know, like, and it could be, because as a child, actually, I wrote that um, a little piece about my uh, grandfather. Because in Italy, um, I, like I left Italy when I was 13. But we lived uh, on a farm on a hill and then the valley below. And uh, uh, sometimes the valley would flood. And I used to have fear of that. And also there was a river that that um you know sometimes we'd have to go over a swing bridge and that was frightening you know and um i don't know it was just in in the dark night you know in those days everything was dark um <laughs> uh, i don't know it's just a little fear maybe in me i that could that i put it into my characters who knows i don't know <laughs> thank you delia um, would you like to say a few words before we close? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. I would like uh, to acknowledge the and thank the AICW for this event, a chanting magazine, and especially, of course, Licia Canton for technical assistance and hosting and overseeing. 
um, I mean, Anne Maria Pia, of course, for her um, uh, translation of my story and being here to read it. And uh, I, I especially thank the Writers Union of Canada and the Canada Council for sponsoring this event. So much appreciated at this time of COVID. Yeah, and, and a special thanks I've here, got here again for uh, Maria Pia and, um, and really a heartfelt appreciation to everyone who kindly turned on the Zoom to attend my reading, our reading, Maria Pia. And uh, yeah, special thanks to Maria Pia. So happy that I had that story translated. Thank you. Maria Pia? Yeah, I'd like to thank you, you Delia, uh, for giving me the opportunity to translate this touching piece. Thanks to Achendi Magazine and the Association of Italian Canadian Writers. Last but not least, thanks to Lita Canton, the host and technical host of this event, but also the cornerstone of the organization of these and other events. Uh, thanks for your work that goes beyond the simple organization. And also thanks to the audience for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. And we look forward to Delia's book coming out now that we know, well, many books actually, it seems like you have lots of, you have the novel in the drawer and stories in boxes. So <laughs> I think you need an assistant. <laughs> Thanks everyone, have a great day.